Thank you for joining the program. I'm Linda Chung, co-chair of the Beverly Hills Bar Association's Trust and Estate Section. Today's webinar is sponsored by the Sanborn team and Manufacturers Bank. The Sanborn team has been sponsoring the Beverly Hills Bar Association's Trust and Estate Section since 2006. Servicing clients for over 35 years, the Sanborn team gives members and colleagues attractive results and peace of mind with a depth of knowledge of a probate, trust, and conservatorship unparalleled in the industry. The Sambo team's ongoing sponsorship demonstrates a tangible commitment to the probate and trust community and the Beverly Hills Bar Association. They are ready to handle any and all sales of real estate in Southern California. Think of them as the first resource for your real estate needs. We also uh, have a Manufacturers Bank sponsoring this program. Manufacturers Bank has been servicing the Beverly Hills professional business market for the past 60 plus years. Its trust and estate group manages over 350 million in trust accounts. Brian Flores, Vice President and Senior Relationship Manager from the Beverly Hills office is available to handle all your trust and estate banking needs. Um, for our section, I have uh, two announcements today. First, uh, it's the time of the year that we accept uh, uh, the applications for the Trust and Estate Executive Committee. So if you are interested in becoming an executive member, uh, you will, uh, when you receive the announcement from the Babylon's Bar by email, please submit your application. Uh, we will make decision in early August. Uh, it's a five-year gig, uh, so be prepared to serve five years, but it's not too much work, and it's actually very fun. Uh, the next uh, announcement is, oh yeah, July program. On July 21st, third Tuesday of July, we'll have a Cheng Che and Sky Moore presenting on planning with the qualified opportunity zones. Um, so please uh, cal mark your calendar now, and hopefully we'll see you. Next, I'm going to introduce, uh, introduce our Andrew Smith, who will give us a monthly update. Good afternoon. I have three legal updates for you today. The first is the case conservatorship of JY. It was in the First District Court of Appeal, case number A157323, filed on May 21st. In this case, respondent was appointed as an LPS conservator of JY's person in 2005 and reappointed several times between 2006 and 2017. In 2018, respondent filed a petition for reappointment as the conservator of JY's person, but JY objected and requested a jury trial. At this trial, JY was compelled to testify, but she objected on the ground that she should not be compelled to testify against herself as it was a violation of her due process and equal protection rights. At the end of the jury trial, JY, who was compelled to testify, was found to be gravely disabled and re respondent was reappointed as her conservator. On appeal, the Court of Appeal found that while there is no constitutional right to refuse to testify in civil proceedings, including LPS commitment proceedings, um, the Court of Appeal noted that people who have been found not guilty by reason of insanity in criminal proceedings, otherwise known as NGIs, have a statutory right to refuse to testify against themselves in civil commitment extension proceedings under section 1026.5 of the penal code. The court ruled that the potential LPS conservatees are sufficiently similarly situated to NGIs with respect to the right against compelled testimony, disagreeing with another recent uh, court of appeal case in Ray Brian S and agreeing with the first district court of appeal decision in Ray EB. The court further found that respondent had failed to establish a compelling reason for the disparate treatment between potential LPS conservatees and NGIs. However, the court did not find that there never could be a compelling reason justifying this disparate treatment, just that the respondent failed to establish one in this case. The next case is Arase v. Medico Investments, LLC. And just real quick, I do apologize for the reverb. Um, I know all of you can hear it, but hopefully we can 
keep going and you can hear me all right. This case is a 2020 case, 48 Cal App 5th, 977, filed on March 24th. After a jury trial, the defendant owner of an elder care residential facility was found to have committed financial elder abuse and neglect. The jury assessed economic damages for the neglect verdict, but assessed no economic or non-economic damages as part of its financial elder abuse verdict. Judgment was entered for plaintiff, including attorney's fees. The defendant appealed the judgment of attorney fees stemming from the financial elder abuse finding, arguing that attorney fees should not be awarded um, where there was no finding of economic damages. The Court of Appeal disagreed with defendant and affirmed the trial court's judgment, finding that under the plain language of Section 15657.5 of the Welfare and Institutions Code, where there is a finding that defendant is liable for financial abuse, an award of attorney's fees is a mandatory form of relief, regardless of whether the plaintiff has awarded any other forms of relief. The final case is a federal Ninth Circuit case, Badgley v. United States, 957 F3D 969, that was filed on April 28, 2020. In this case, decedent transferred her partnership interest in a family-run company into a GRAT for the ultimate benefit of her daughters while retaining a right to an annuity paid from the GRAT for 15 years, at which point the GRAT's corpus would pass to the daughters. However, decedent died before the 15-year annuity period had expired. The executor of decedent's estate included the full value of the GRAT's assets in decedent's gross estate on the 706, but subsequently brought a suit asserting that decedent's estate overpaid the state taxes based on the inclusion of the entire date of death value of the GRAT. The executor argued that only the net present value of the unpaid annuity payment should have been included. The district court found against the executor and held that the full date of death value of the GRAT was includable in decedent's gross estate because decedent retained both a right to income and a continued enjoyment from the property at the time of her death. The Ninth Circuit affirmed. It first found that while Section 2036 of the Internal Revenue Code, which discusses includability of transfers with the retained life estate, does not specifically mention annuities, annuities are still covered by the statute. The court then ruled that when a grantor derives substantial present economic benefit from property, as the season still did during the 15-year period of the GRAT, she retains the enjoyment of the property for purposes of Section 2036 and as such, because decedent died before the termination of the GRAT, the partnership interest was not transferred to its beneficiaries before her death, and it, quote, remained tied to her by the string she created. And now I'd like to turn it over to Megan Perkle Earhart, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you, Andrew. We are um, lucky to hear today to have uh, three speakers with us, Laura, Laurel Gutierrez, Catherine Ghost, and Elizabeth Blasco from McDermott Will Memory. Laurel has a diverse practice representing high net worth individuals and their families with respect to all aspects of gift, estate, and generation escaping wealth transfer tax planning, as well as trust and estate administration. She advises domestic and multinational high net worth clients and families to develop and orchestrate innovative solutions around wealth transfer, philanthropic giving, and multifaceted estate planning needs. While in law school, Laurel served on the University of San Francisco Law Review. She frequently writes and speaks on sophisticated estate planning and fiduciary income tax issues for professional organizations. Catherine Ghost's practice focuses on estates, trusts, and tax planning for high net worth clients. She has experience drafting and administering dynasty trusts, supervising trust administrations, preparing federal estate and gift tax returns, and working with private foundations. Elizabeth Glasgow focuses her practice on multi-generational wealth preservation and tax minimization, including the creation and implementation of dynasty trusts, business succession plans, asset protection strategies, and charitable giving structures for business owners, real estate investors, entrepreneurs, and families managing inherited wealth. She provides comprehensive advice on a wide range of issues facing mobile high net worth individuals and geographically dispersed families, including coordinated income tax planning across multiple jurisdictions. Elizabeth speaks frequently on the subject of estate planning and income and tax transfer tax strategies. Please welcome Laurel, Catherine, and Elizabeth. Thank you, Megan. We are very honored to have been asked to speak before or present to your group on fiduciary income taxes and taxation of California trusts and entities. 
Uh, as we know, who have lived in California for a while, California is a lovely place to live. Uh, we've got the mountains, we've got the uh, oceans, the valleys, um, but there was one big problem with California, as we all know, and that's the taxes in California. Um, taxes uh, are very, very high, and um, they uh, can hit you when you're not expecting it, especially with respect to trust taxation. So we, I don't know if any of you have experienced it, but I've, I've been dealing quite a bit recently with trusts that thought that they were non-California trusts, but have discovered, unfortunately, that for many years they have been California trusts for fiduciary income tax purposes, and that uh, is a big, unpleasant surprise to them. Similarly, we've been dealing with LLCs and entities who have been recently discovered to be doing business in California because of the slippery slope of a 0.2% ownership interest in an entity that uh, could cause an LLC or partnership to uh, become doing, um, be deemed to be doing business in California. So what we're going to try to do today is give you a little bit of information about how best to advise your clients to hopefully avoid the slippery slope of California income tax or um, maybe the, the long reach of the California income tax system. Uh, on slide three, we're going to go through um, uh, the agenda items. We're going to hopefully get through everything today, but it's, it's first going to be the California taxation of grantor trusts. Then we will discuss California taxation of non-grantor trusts, followed by taxation of distributions to California beneficiaries, and finally, taxation of various entities as holding companies. So we are going to start with Katie Ghost giving us a, uh, a rundown of California taxation of trusts, the federal view. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Laurel. Uh, so we're on slide four, if you're following along. Um, so California has really incorporated the federal grantor and non-grantor um, tax rules. So understanding the federal rules uh, is applicable to, to a lot of California taxation. So um, at the federal level, there are four flavors of trusts for income tax purposes. Um, the first is a grantor trust, which um, is not is a trust that does not pay its own taxes. Rather, there's an outside party, uh, usually the settlor, grantor, um, who is deemed to be the income tax owner of the trust. And uh, the, the trust um, you know, makes it fairly easy for income tax purposes because you know, the um, income tax owner reports all the income and pays the associated taxes and it's, it's pretty clean. <laughs> and as we'll talk later, there's uh, a lot of estate tax advantages to that um, structure as well. Um, Non-grantor trusts are the opposite. The trusts bear their own income taxes. They're their own separate taxpayers. Um, there's two flavors of non-grantor trusts, simple, which are in fact as simple as you get under the tax code. Um, they distribute all their income and make no principal distributions. And then complex trusts, which is everything else. Um, and unfortunately, mostly what we deal with in the non-grantor world is, is the everything else. Uh, and we'll get into some of those rules uh, later on. I think Elizabeth. Sure. So continuing on to the, the next slide, um, slide five, we're going to talk about how grantor trusts are really operating in California. And as Katie said, because California has adopted the federal grantor trust rules, we don't have to learn anything new in this case um, in terms of variations between the federal and state law. Uh, and so what we're familiar with is that the grantor trusts essentially for tax purposes in California disregard the existence of the trust. They're passing those income tax liabilities on to the grantor. Um, what's interesting though to think a little bit about is that that rule about the taxation of grantor trusts um, being taxable in California to a resident California grantor, you know, is requires a residency determination of the, the California grantor. And so in some ways, when we're looking at grantor trust rules, we also have to sort of brush off our residency determination um, assessment skills to make sure that we're aware of whether or not we have a grantor living in California so that we know which grantor trusts are obviously also going to be picked up into that California tax net. Uh, and so residency you know, this is something that we might typically be reviewing for clients who are planning to leave California 
possibly around a tax plan so that they're establishing residency in another jurisdiction. Uh, and so as a this reminder that when we're doing that, we're really not looking at looking for some sort of bright line rule. California is not really a day count type jurisdiction. They are looking for tax residency based on domicile. And while certainly presence is a big factor in domicile and can create certain presumptions, as you'll see sort of outlined on slide five, um, a lot of times what we're looking for, you know, are uh, assessments of domicile based on some presence, um, but excluding presence for transitory or temporary purposes. That would be for people who've come into the state for vacations or for short-term working. Um, but being outside of California doesn't necessarily guarantee that you're beyond the tax reach there either. So even, for example, being away from California, but having not actually affirmatively established a domicile elsewhere, so not had sufficient evidence that you have really picked up and moved and are not planning to return, um, you Sort of haven't broken that home state connection um, can still find you subject to tax in California um, regardless of the fact that your physical presence may be elsewhere. And why this is important is because when we are working with clients who uh, maybe are engaging in residency planning, we need to be cautious of advising them that if that residency planning is not successful, meaning you know you've attempted to pick up and and now move to this low or no income tax state, um, you know, if you're not successful, we're not just looking at the tax liability that you may have been trying to avoid in California for your personal tax assets, but also that residency will be related back to your status as a grantor of a grantor trust, uh, and that we have to look at really that more holistic approach. So again, the federal rules are, uh, you know, adopted here in California, but in some ways, because of California's uh, fairly robust residency determinations, we've got to be very careful about when we might identify a grantor, uh, or I'm sorry, a resident of California, um, understanding when they are a grantor of a grantor trust. Um, but Katie, take it on to the sort of the <laughs> other side, non-grantor trusts, which we see so much more often now in our practice. Um, you know, as income tax becomes such an important consideration. Yeah, yeah. So um, the non-grantor system, um, it, again, there's two flavors, a simple trust and a complex trust. The simple trust is, is pretty intuitive when it comes to uh, the tax regime. It distributes out all its income, so therefore it's not paying income tax on anything. It's the beneficiary's obligation to pay. Um, and of course, those might be at different rates. You might have beneficiaries who are in California or not, so there's, you know, a lot to Think about there, but the, the um, tax system is pretty straightforward. For complex trusts, uh, gives me a headache every single time I look at it. <laughs> um, it's not so clear whether you're distributing principal or income, and the um, the code is set up such that you don't have to tra trace the assets that are being distributed. Um, rather, the trust bears all its income taxes, but it gets a deduction for amounts distributed. Um, those, that deduction is capped at distributable net income. Um, and then the beneficiary who receives the distributions pays taxes on those distributions, again, subject to distributable net income. Um, what is DNI, distributable net income, besides very hard to say? Um, it's basically taxable income with um, some, some big uh, exceptions. Most notably, capital gains are not included. And um, also income associated with... Um, uh, with, uh, sorry, S corporation, um, uh, stock held in electing small business trusts. Um, and it's, I know for, for my clients and Laurel and Elizabeth can share here too. It's always a discussion about whether we go the grantor or non grantor route. Um, there are so many estate tax advantages to having a grantor trust where, the grantor pays taxes, reducing his estate and allowing the trust assets to grow tax-free, mostly. Um, it's obviously a huge uh, estate tax advantage, but often uh, <laughs> clients see the tax bill, they're, they're personally going to have to write and think twice about it. Um, I've had people say, you know, I've given my kids enough, I'm not paying their taxes too. Um, <laughs> so, you know, um, we, we try and steer people Often it's, it's advantageous to go with grantor trusts unless there's some specific reason for non-grantor trusts, um, such as um, utilizing QSBS elections. Um, but sometimes the client just doesn't have the cash flow or doesn't want to deal with it. And I do think it's increasingly more common now. You know, when I first started practicing, 
you know, you looked at someone's portfolio of trust and unless they had a non-grantor trust in their portfolio because, you know, they've had a family member pass away, that was really the situation where you saw these non-grantor trusts. Utilizing that sort of a proactive planning technique was not as common. And, and, you know, that's obviously somewhat a function of the changing exemption amounts and the different tax laws and, and increasing focus on our income tax planning. Um, but it has certainly made our need to understand the variety of different uh, taxation models that are then subject to each of these trusts more important because we are finding now clients will more often have, you know, perhaps a grantor trust, a non grantor trust trust in different jurisdictions that are taking advantage of different tax laws associated with, with this place of residency, potentially, of those different trusts. Uh, so we have a, a lot of opportunity, frankly, sometimes for footballs. <laughs> um, and we'll talk a little bit later about you know, some differences here in California that I think colleagues across the country are not necessarily aware of and where we can see some you know, opportunities for mistakes that others can make that we're hoping to avoid today. So if we look ahead to slide seven, um, in terms of non-grantor trusts being subject to tax in California, um, California is a fairly aggressive state uh, taxation of trusts jurisdiction, meaning that they're finding a lot of different opportunities to tax these non-grantor trusts. Uh, and so we've got three big ones. Um, a lot of other states have only one or two. So the first, of course, is California sourced income. That's not necessarily that surprising. Um, but then we have sort of a two-pronged approach then for the taxation of non-grantor trusts based on residency in state of what are called non-contingent beneficiaries and also residency in state of fiduciaries. And we'll talk more about specifically, you know, what the assessments are of non-contingent beneficiaries and fiduciaries um, a little bit later as we go down in, into the details. But I think it's interesting to just be aware that California does have a little bit broader approach. Um, and yet at the same time, there are so many things that are actually immaterial, things that you would think might be very relevant to an assessment of a trust taxation model, um, things like the governing law or um, in not for non-grantor trust, the residency of the grantor being irrelevant is, is sometimes a bit of a surprise. So there's a, a lot of chances to get tripped up of thinking, well, this seems like it would be something that's very important to a taxation model. It's true in California, there are a lot of things that may end up um, being the reason that California is able to get its taxation base into the trust income, um, either in whole or in part, but many other things that will turn out to be immaterial. Um, so talking a little bit more specifically about the example of taxation of a, a California or California taxation of a non-grantor trust based on the residency of beneficiaries. So the tax code talks about looking at the, or California tax code talks about looking about the non-contingent beneficiaries in a trust to assess whether or not any of them are resident in California and that that residency tie will be sufficient to subject the trust to taxation. Um, if you have just one beneficiary who is non-contingent and in California, all of the trust's income will be subject to California tax. And if you have multiple beneficiaries, you end up in a proportionate arrangement. So what's interesting, though, is non-contingent beneficiaries are, are not necessarily sort of a frequently discussed term in both the legislation and in tax and then also in some of the rulings and cases. Um, probably, you know, we have sort of a standard definition from the statute that says a non-contingent beneficiary is basically someone whose interest is not subject to a condition precedent. So some condition precedents are fairly clear. So it'll be something like, um, you know, the beneficiary has attained a particular age, you know, there's a milestone event after which the trust oftentimes will terminate or terminate as to a significant portion. Um, and by vesting the beneficiary, they've reached that milestone, and they have become non contingent. Um, we also have a ruling from the California FTB from back in 2006, where they sort of gave us a chance to really clarify what contingent beneficiaries were, and then non-contingent beneficiaries will presumably be everything else. Um, so when you have contingent beneficiaries, this FTB ruling found was when you will have the trustee having discretion 
such that the activities of the tr or trustee are what really will end up triggering um, the entitlement of the beneficiary to assets in that trust. So the exercise of the, dis the trustee's discretion is the condition precedent, and upon the exercise of that discretion, the beneficiary's interests have become vested. Um, and so what we will see that though, in that in that ruling is that thing that you're reading a trust for the first time and you're able to say, here's our non-contingent uh, non-contingent beneficiary. Rather, this is going to be based on you know activities and events that are happening during the trust's existence. Um, more recently, we've actually had two cases that I think speak a lot to the issue of state taxation of trust, because in both of the cases, the um, Franchise Tax Board put forth um, assessments of or arguments about taxation in these cases that involved an argument related to non-contingent beneficiaries. And the reason Laurel is going to talk about the, these cases in more detail, but as an introductory high level, I think one of the reasons that there's something that we pay a lot of attention to is because they are um, taking more modern trust law concepts and introducing them and being conversant with the FTB about them. Um, what we'll see as we talk a little bit more is that these statutes can be a little bit black and white. So there are non-contingent or contingent beneficiaries. There will be fiduciaries resident in state or not. Um, but in modern trust law, we are seeing much more um, you know, variations on how a trust is administered, different types of roles that might be played in a trust, like a trust protector or an investment advisor. Um, these things are, are not, they predate, or I'm sorry, these statutes really predate these modern um, trust terms often. And where we see that particularly in these two recent cases come down to the idea of whether or not you can take this idea of a non-contingent beneficiary which I initially presented as somewhat of a stark situation. Either your beneficiary is going to reach a certain milestone or your trustee is going to exercise certain discretion. And what we saw the FTB in both the Paula Trust case and the Metropolis Family Trust um, cases is looking for a perhaps broader definition of what would be sufficient to classify a beneficiary as non-contingent. Um, so for example, in the Paula Trust case, we had um, routine distributions uh, that suggested from the FTB's example that the um, the discretion was, was perhaps no longer really being exercised. Uh, and similarly in Metropolis, it was the, the fact that the beneficiary had some degree of influence over the decision makers, um, the ability to remove and replace these various offices uh, was an argument for the FTB to say, you know, it's looking less like that beneficiary is contingent. They seem to be exercising influence or having some control over the decision making authority. That seems to suggest to us you're in non-contingent territory. Um, again, because, you know, that idea of being able to remove and replace it is perhaps a more modern trust law concept, um, it's interesting to see the FTB sort of bringing these forward and, and trying to get them to interact with these statutes. Now, interestingly, the FTB in the Metropolis case ended up conceding the point that the beneficiary was contingent, but the fact that they brought it originally as one of their claims um, was certainly of note. Um, so, but the biggest, you know, recent tax law case uh, dealing with trusts is coming to us really from the Supreme Court. And so we definitely want to understand how that's affecting our taxes here. Yeah, so we had a um, the first in almost a century uh, cases decided by the U.S. Supreme Court on the on fiduciary income taxes, and that was the case of North Carolina Department of Revenue versus Kimberly Rice Kessner 1992 Family Trust. And in this case, we had a um, a trust that the only contact with North Carolina was the residence of a contingent beneficiary in North Carolina. Uh, and North Carolina wanted to impose a tax on the income of the trust because the, the uh, North Carolina statute said that it could tax income that was being held basically for the benefit of a, um, a North Carolina individual. So um, this uh, statute was found to be unconstitutional at the state level and the tax, uh, the taxing authority um, 
uh, appealed that decision and took it up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court granted cert. And unfortunately, when the U.S. Supreme Court actually um, decided this matter, it decided it really limited to the facts of, of the Kastner case and the Kastner Trust. So it doesn't have broad application, but there are little pieces of information that I think are really important for all of us to think about when we might be thinking about challenging the imposition of tax on a uh, um, the income of a trust or on the income of a beneficiary in California. So let's look at the contacts that North Carolina had um, with the trust. And as I said previously, it just had a, a contingent beneficiary located in North Carolina. The trustee was out of North Carolina. It had not been settled by North Carolina residents. Um, and that beneficiary who was in North Carolina had no ability to control uh, the assets of the trust or distributions from the trust. The, the trustee had full discretionary authority uh, without any kind of ascertainable standard to make distributions to this beneficiary. Interestingly though, this trust was supposed to terminate basically a year after the, the, the taxing year in question. Um, but the court didn't look at that really. Um, the, 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 trust didn't actually terminate it. Um, the trustees who were in New York used the New York decanting statute to extend the term of the trust far beyond the, the following year. And so the court just looked at the fact that this trust was going to go on for um, basically the lifetime of the beneficiary uh, without the, the beneficiary receiving a vested interest in this trust. When the court was doing its analysis, it was really focusing on due process and whether the state, I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear that, but the neighbor's um, gardener just started, I apologize. Um, so the, the question was whether the state really had sufficient contacts with the trust and with the beneficiary in order to impose the tax on, on the, the uh, trust income. And um, in deciding that the, the state did not have sufficient contacts with the trust or the beneficiary, number one, the court understood that there is a difference between a trust and the beneficiary. So perhaps the, the, the um, state had sufficient contacts with the beneficiary if we are just dealing on a one-on-one -on -one taxation situation between the state and the beneficiary, but we've got an, a, a, another party involved. So the question was, could the state tax the trust? And the court found that there were insufficient contacts between the state and the trust in order for the state to impose a tax. There has to be some kind of minimum contacts between the state and the trust to, enact, to allow the state to tax the trust. And just having a fully discretionary beneficiary who has no potential right to the income of this trust cannot enforce a right to the income of the trust. The court found that that was insufficient in order for the state to actually impose a tax on the Kimberly um, Kastner Trust. So how does that apply to California? Well, when we have a contingent beneficiary, um, you know, we have a, a kind of slippery scale of what a contingent beneficiary is. We know from the uh, 2006 TAM that a contingent beneficiary is someone whose interest is subject to a condition precedent. And according to that TAM, it's also a beneficiary or the, the, the uh, rights of the trustee to make distributions are fully within the, the discretion of the trustee. There is no ascertainable standard whatsoever. So we know that in the eyes of the, the Franchise Tax Board is a contingent beneficiary. But what then happens if you've got a beneficiary uh, or a trust that can make distributions pursuant to an ascertainable standard. And the, the word is that the trustee shall make a distribution to the beneficiary for health, support, maintenance, or education. Does that convert it to a, uh, a non-contingent beneficiary, a non-contingent interest in the trust? Because the beneficiary actually could go into court and um, get a court order forcing the trustee to make a distribution to that beneficiary. That is the position of the Franchise Tax Board. That is the position that they have taken in a number of different cases, including the Paula Trust case. Um, so, you know, you have to be very careful if there's an ascertainable standard involved in, in a trust that you are looking at. So what happens if you just switch it to may? So the trustee may make a distribution pursuant to an ascertainable standard of health support, maintenance, education. Well, the trustee or the beneficiary can no longer go into court and force a distribution because it now really is in the discretion of the trustee as to whether a distribution will ever be made. 
does that stop the franchise tax board from trying to make a claim that um, you still have a standard that the that the trustee is supposed to follow? You know, we we don't know, but um, it it gives you a little bit of grace in that um, the beneficiary can no longer demand a distribution um, under threat of of lawsuit. So, um, you know, that's that's a potential. Um, the other questions that were raised, as um, Elizabeth mentioned in the Metropolis case, is you know what what other kinds of powers can the beneficiary possess uh, without being um, subject to challenge by the franchise tax board? Can they have the ability to remove and replace a trustee? Um, of course, you know the trustee can't. Um, there can't be like unfettered control that the the beneficiary could then have the trustees. Um, distribution powers would, would still probably have to be limited to an ascertainable standard, but what if the beneficiary has the ability to remove and replace that trustee and put in someone very favorable to the beneficiary? Is that sufficient to make the beneficiary's interest uh, non-contingent? We don't know. Um, so just when you're looking at trust and analyzing trust, you have to pick apart all the decisions that are being exercised and by whom, and does that beneficiary become a fiduciary as a result of having the ability to make certain dis decisions with respect to the trust, including investment decisions. You know, for federal tax purposes, having the ability to make investment decisions does not cause the beneficiary to have uh, be subject to different kinds of tax on the trust. Um, but, you know, if the beneficiary has the ability to make investment decisions, uh, in the Metropolis case, that was a factor that the FTB pointed to as um, making the, um, the beneficiary's interest non-contingent. Um, Lorella, if, if I could ask you a, a practical question, because I yep. think this is a, a topic that is really difficult, I mean, for all of us to face in terms of, as you just said, we're going to have to pick apart and look at all of these different factors. It frankly, to me, doesn't seem that practical to have actually also discussed all of those factors with the clients, right? I mean, I think my clients are mostly glazing over, you know, after I've explained that we're going to use a revocable trust for probate avoidance, you know, there's sort of tolerance for the real minutia of what we're accomplishing for them in all of these different structures. I mean, so even something as one word in the document, shall versus may, and pot the potential that that difference has impact, just, you know, from your personal experience, how much are you necessarily um, discussing all of this with the clients um, versus kind of putting somewhat of our own judgment as counselors that that's our responsibility to, to give them the advice that they've received from, or, you know, our, our judgment, I should say. Um, how do you play that? So usually I, I ask the client, uh, what is their their goal with respect to income tax. Are they concerned about California income tax? You know, are they, are all of the beneficiaries residing in California and intend to reside in California forever? And so if you're not getting hit with an immediate income tax because they are a non-contingent beneficiary, they would eventually get hit with a throwback tax. You know, if, if it's, if they don't really care about the income tax consequences of that trust, then, you know, that governs or directs me in terms of how I am then assisting the client in drafting the trust. And I am not going through all the minutia, but if they say they want a certain thing in the trust, uh, and I know that that can cause potential income tax consequences, I will guide them away from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, what, where, where does this all leave us then? So, you know, if you have a situation where you um, might have a, a, um, non-contingent beneficiary um, under maybe the FTB's argument, uh, but you think that there are not sufficient contacts between California and the beneficiary's interest in the trust to uh, support a constitutional or to support the tax, then you know I would give it some thought as to whether you want to challenge the, the uh, statute. For example, if you've got a beneficiary of a trust who is fully discretionary, um, they are the sole beneficiary of the trust, or perhaps they are the sole beneficiary who actually receives a distribution from the trust in a given year, and that distribution makes that beneficiary a non-contingent beneficiary. Well, under the plain reading of the statute, if there's, a if there's one non-contingent beneficiary and that non-contingent beneficiary resides in California, then purportedly all of the income of the trust is subject to California income tax. But what if there's a million dollars of income in that trust and the beneficiary receives 
$50,000 of, of income. Does that give California the right to tax the million dollars of income or only the $50,000 of income? Um, you know, I would say based on the Kaysner case that you, do, you don't have the ability or California does not have the ability to tax the million dollars of income because there has to be some rational relation between California and all of that income. And if that income is never going to be distributed to that beneficiary, or we don't know whether it will ever be distributed to that beneficiary, how does California have the constitutional right to tax all of that income? I think it's something that um, we should be looking at carefully. I think that there's going to be a number of cases that arise that deal with this issue. But in the meantime, understand that, for example, the Paula Trust case, where there were uh, distributions, as, as Elizabeth mentioned, on an annual basis to the beneficiary, the, um, the uh, Superior Court case, the judge said that the interest of the beneficiary was contingent regardless of the fact that there were distribution made, distributions made, because the, the court focused on the fact that the, dis, the distribution was solely in the, ben, in the interest, sorry, in the discretion of the trustee. So there's a big fight still going on. Um, oral arguments are gonna be heard in the Paula Trust case on June 24, so stay tuned for what will be coming next in that matter. Um, so, uh, I think that's enough of me and talking about this. Katie, do you want to go on <laughs> with non-grantor trust? Yeah, so we've talked about the status of beneficiaries and how their residents can trigger California taxation. Um, another way that California uh, can subject a trust to tax is based on the residence of its fiduciaries. Um, if all fiduciaries are California residents, uh, the trust will be subject to um, California income tax on 100% of its income. If it's only if it only has two out of three California fiduciaries, then it's subject to tax on two thirds of the income and so on. Um, an individual fiduciary's residence is based on the individual residency determination rules that Elizabeth discussed. It's pretty straightforward. Um, well, straightforward to say, not to apply. <laughs> um, the the trickiest thing here is determining what a fiduciary is for these purposes. You know, obviously we think. And, and most of us are pretty aware that you don't want to name a California trustee if you're trying to avoid uh, California income tax. But what about a trust protector? What about an appointer whose sole job it is to fill vacancies? Maybe we provide that that person is not a fiduciary, but California might not necessarily accept that. So I think the safest option is to avoid having California residents in any sort of office holder position under the trust. That's obviously pretty tricky to do. You know, I'm still waiting to find my client who has you know, six trustworthy investment savvy best friends living in Nevada who they, you know, are comfortable delegating that to. Um, but it is certainly the safest thing if, if you want to sidestep California. Elizabeth, well, I think you're on mute. Sorry, <laughs> trying to keep the feedback. Um, I have a neighbor who's learning the electric guitar, which is a lot of fun <laughs> at working from home. Um, so uh, just wanted to piggyback off of one of Katie's comments about, you know, we all know that it would generally be a bad idea to appoint a California fiduciary if you are, you know, trying to specifically plan around California state income tax taxation of these trusts. That may be true on this phone call. Um, I actually started my practice in New York before moving to California. And I don't think it was just me that as an out of state practitioner had absolutely no idea about this rule and certainly was working with families that were sort of split between East Coast and West Coast and probably routinely appointing California people into these important decision making roles, having no awareness whatsoever that this was causing a big tax problem. Um, and, you know, so one, I, I think to the extent that you are networking with people outside of California, what a great way to sort of promote from some business for us of to say, you know, know everything can touch California if you're not careful um, you know so make sure to be yeah. <laughs> checking with us or or you know just educate your friends um, that might be in other jurisdictions because we'll talk a little bit later about how to fix mistakes but it would of course be much better to not get in the mistake in the first place and just avoid that person um, you know, triggering the California taxation by having been a resident fiduciary. Um, I mean, even the main fiduciaries like trustees that are, are sort of very clearly within the California taxation definitions of fiduciaries, um, you know, out-of-state practitioners just may, may have no reason to know that. 
You know, there was a, a chief counsel memo um, back, I, I want to say 20 plus years ago, in which there were, um, I think, three, three uh, um, fiduciaries, two of which uh, were outside of California, I believe, and one of which was, or vice versa. But the, the Franchise Task Board at that point in time looked at the totality of their actions and whether any one of them could um, could basically veto the actions of the others in determining whether you've got a California fiduciary. So it was an interesting case. I haven't seen any uh, comment on it after that point, um, but uh, they were, I guess, a little bit kinder and gentler at that time than they are now. <laughs> Um, so, uh, um, with respect to um, a fiduciary, so if we've got a fiduciary in California and a fiduciary outside of California, the historical thought had been, and I'm on, on slide 12, the historical thought had been that you would um, tax all of the California source income uh, to the trust, and then you would start allocating or portioning the other non-source income um, to California based on the number of fiduciaries in and out of California and the, the number of um, non-contingent beneficiaries in and out of California. Well, the Paula Trust case kind of turned that on its head um, with the argument and a successful argument that actually the, um, the sourcing rules uh, are subject to the, um, the apportionment rules as well. I'm not going to go into a big uh, um, description of how the uh, taxpayer came to that argument. It's basically a glitch in the um, in the interpretation of the tax code um, or the revenue and tax code. Uh, but just know that one of the issues that's going on in the Paula Trust case is an argument as to whether California source income, if you've got a, um, a, a trustee in and out of California, whether that source income sh should be subject to apportionment as well. Uh, like I said, the taxpayer won um, at the most recent level, but it's up on appeal. So oral arguments, June 24. Elizabeth, you want to tell us more about the Paula Trust case? I actually think you want to tell us more about the Paula Trust case. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to tell you more about the Paula Trust case. Um, <laughs> So what should the what should trustees do in the meantime uh, with Paula Trust and and um, with its uh, with the effects of the Paula Trust case? Well, some people have actually been um, have been loading up their trust with non-California trustees or fiduciaries so that you can uh, subject the uh, source income to um, more of a uh, lopsided apportionment instead of getting hit with all of the California income tax on the source income. I don't know if you'd really want to do that, and number number one, and number two, I don't know if you, your clients know that many people outside of California that they could load up on the uh, on the trust uh, in various fiduciary capacities. But you know that's something that people have been doing. They've been filing for refunds, uh, making claims for refunds under the Paula Trust rule. Um, we're getting so close to the oral arguments that um, you know maybe the franchise tax board, including with the with COVID, uh, isn't going to be really paying attention uh, to these claims for refund as of yet, but um, it is something that uh, if you've got a large uh, California source income tax bill that has occurred in the last year or two, uh, and you've got um, a potential argument that you've got trustees or fiduciaries in and out of California, uh, you might be wanting to advise your clients to, to do a, a claim for a refund uh, based on the, on the uh, Paula Trust matter. Um, so just uh, moving ahead to slide 14, most of this presentation is about obviously the taxation of trust, um, but we wanted to take a moment to just uh, quickly address the taxation of the, the beneficiaries that may be receiving distributions out of those trusts. Um, so, you know, a non-resident beneficiary in terms of subjecting uh, any trust distributions to California income tax for that beneficiary, that, that's really looking to the California sourced income. When you have a California resident beneficiary, they are receiving um, or are subject to California income tax on the distributions of income from their non -grant or from the non grantor trust. And we've got the standard rule that um, distributions of principal, you know, are not subject to California income tax. But I think, as Katie mentioned, what is sometimes sort of broadly referred to as principal in terms of the excluding the realized capital gains from DNI, that can be quite a footfall sometimes for people in terms of you know, thinking that that should be principle that's not subject to taxation. Um, 
so in terms of when you have then a California beneficiary who's sometimes actually also receiving distributions that could be in excess of what the trust's current income is, um, you're not necessarily scot-free on avoiding California income tax on that excess distribution because there may have been circumstances at play during the previous administration of the trust that would be relevant for an assessment um, as to the California taxation on that excess. So the first is where you're looking at circumstances where uh, California income tax should have been being paid by the trust. The trustee was obligated to pay that and it was not being paid for whatever reason. Um, and then also if there has been a history where the had there been a non-contingent beneficiary during this period of time, um, it was the beneficiary was in fact contingent and subsequently becomes non-contingent, you're potentially picking up um, some California income taxation as, as there as well. You've also, uh, again, going back to this point about um, a common trust term of saying, you know, when there is income that is not fully distributed in a trust, it is being added to principal. Um, that's a term that we all use uh, sort of for fiduciary accounting purposes, but in fact, for tax purposes, they are still keeping track of what is considered taxable income. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so in terms of then the, the California tax on distributions of that accumulated income, Laurel, where, do you have any sort of planning suggestions or things for that? It can be an unpleasant surprise, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very unpleasant surprise. And I'm actually counseling uh, a couple of clients on this matter right now because there's an antis anticipated termination of the trust in a couple of years and there's been um, accumulated capital gains in the trust that um, have been accumulating for decades. So, you know, one easy way, um, easy in terms of it's simple to explain it to the client is move out of California before the termination occurs. Um, you know, that's not really palatable to a lot of clients because they think, um, you know, why am, number one, why am I moving out? Number two, how long do I have to move out before I can move back to my home? Which really kind of blows the whole idea of uh, actually moving out of California because you've retained your residency if you think that this is still your domicile and your residence. So um, moving out is not always the easiest solution. Uh, what some people have, have uh, suggested is do a decanting of that trust to a new trust that is out of California. Uh, because the statute really is talking about uh, the, the income of this trust. So if you've got a brand new trust that um, has received these assets and it's outside of California, uh, even if it does have California beneficiaries, um, you know, some people um, believe that you've cleansed that income. I'm not sure that that really works, but it's a, a, um, a strategy that some people think um, could, could be successful. Um, have either of you thought about that that type of transaction? You know, so, so I have looked at sort of similar analysis with clients where we're really focusing on their residency move as being a solution. And that has been a tough sell in, in several cases. A lot of times, I don't know if this is true in your case, but the, the trust that we're working with is quite a historic dynasty trust. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's hitting beneficiaries in my particular case, who are relatively young, you know, young kids around, very invested in sort of their presence in California. So they may not be either so young or so old that they might have more movement flexibility. Yeah. And something that a lot of people don't really focus on is the fact that, um, let's say it's a pot trust for a number of people and you've got, um, you know, a couple of California resident beneficiaries at the time of a distribution, or there have been a series of California resident beneficiaries without a break in the, um, in the uh, time that there's been a California contingent beneficiary. Let's say there's been, there's been no break since 1990. There's been a constant um, flow of California beneficiaries. Well, even if you've got a beneficiary who's only lived in California for one year when there's a terminating distribution, that accumulation of income over the many years since 1990, 1990 when there has been any California resident beneficiary, all of that income is going to be basically charged potentially pro rata amongst all of the then California beneficiaries, or if there's only one current California beneficiary, um, they're going to get hit with all of the accumulation uh, distribution tax. So it's kind of an unfair system that we have right now. This is um, at least 
you know, I've had, I've had many uh, CPAs who have said you go back beyond when there was any California beneficiary to when the first was the trust was first created and you tax that current beneficiary with all of the accumulation um, since the beginning of the trust. I think that that is not what the statute is trying to say. It's, it's when there has been, when there's been accumulation of income, when there's been a non-contingent beneficiary. Um, so at least we don't have to worry about that. But um, you know, it is it is a, a bit of an eye opener when people realize that there's been a string of California contingent beneficiaries for decades, and they are going to get hit with the tax. Um, so it's it's not a pleasant situation. Other people have have postulated whether you can turn the trust into a grantor trust for some period of time, um, and whether that cleanses the accumulated income. I don't necessarily understand how that could cleanse the um, the income, the accumulated income, but um, there are people out there talking about that as well. So I wanted to make sure um, we have a chance because we've talked about a lot of potential footfalls and Katie does have some information yeah. for us on um, how to fix mistakes if they if they have been identified. And then I'd also just like to say, you know, it's your fault you invited three estate planners to talk about um, <laughs> state taxation of trust. I realize now that we have spent all of our time on trust, but we will encourage you, there, there are some end materials um, in the presentation that do focus more on entities and apologize that we just got so excited about our area. <laughs> It's mostly what we think about. Um, so yeah, as Elizabeth said, there, there are some ways to fix these footfalls, um, especially um, uh, for truly a sort of out-of-state taxpayers. Uh, so California has a statutory voluntary disclosure program. Um, if, you were, if you qualify, um, you file and pay taxes associated with the past six years of returns. Um, penalties can be waived and any liabilities from before those six years can be waived as well. Um, trusts qualify um, as long as they were not administered in California. So we're truly, you know, looking at the situation where it was a New York, say, New York family, um, New York um, advisors um, happened to trigger uh, California taxation that they were not aware of. Um, and I think Laurel actually had some success with submitting an application for this. I don't know if you can talk about that. Yeah, so I submitted an application, I think it was last year, for um, trusts that had not, there were several trusts that had not ever filed in California, even though they had California, arguably, um, not arguably, truly non-contingent beneficiaries because they had been receiving distributions. Uh, and it went actually very smoothly uh, and quickly, so don't be afraid of going that route. They assign a specific person to work with you, so um, so it's a, a great, a great, um, um, relief mechanism for clients who unwittingly fell within the California income tax. Yeah. It's not as well known a program as the federal disclosure program for foreign assets, but it definitely can be helpful. And actually it has become a more common um, question that I ask clients. You know, I feel like I have a, a client intake uh, questionnaire that you know, started out relatively short. And as every time I saw, you know, some stumbling block or mistake happening somewhere, it's like, add that to the questionnaire. Um, and so now oftentimes, even if a client is just coming to me for the first time on, you know, their own personal estate tax planning, um, or, you know, I do ask them about, you know, any places where they may be serving in capacities. Because a lot of times, and I think we all fall um, victim to this, you know, we ask a lot of people in our clients' lives to take on, you know, uh, trustee positions, trust protectors, things like that. And they may seem relatively benign at the time. I mean, I think of simple life insurance trusts that you don't really give a lot of thought to. But over time, obviously, after a client passes away or, or different circumstances where those roles may become more meaningful, um, the client may still be in the back of their mind thinking of it as maybe not the biggest deal in the world. And their residency, again, here in California, may be subjecting them, you know, as a fiduciary to potential liability for not having been aware of the state laws that they, or state taxation laws that they were subjecting the tax to. So I would encourage, um, you know, it can be yet another question on that lengthy sort of intake process to make sure that we're aware of that for all of our clients. Yeah. Um, so it looks like actually we've been given a few extra minutes of grace period if, if you want to stay with us. Um, but I'd actually say we, we concluded the presentation of if you proceed ahead to the last two slides um, with just some sort of interesting current updates that are happening and, and Laurel can chat about that. Sure. 
So um, on the entity taxation side, what we've seen a lot of um, in the recent years are, um, are LLC members who are out of state or, um, or uh, corporate GPs of California LPs and whether those entities are doing business in California. There was a case uh, back, I think in 2017, SWART Enterprises that um, came down with a rule that if there was a point 2% membership interest in an LLC that uh, it did not constitute that that um, ownership interest without having any other kind of indicia of control or management of the entity, um, whether that 0.2% um, interest uh, would be viewed as, as doing business in California. And um, the court said no, that the 0.2% interest without any other kind of management control or, or other type of indicia of ownership whether that um, would be sufficient to tax uh, on a doing business basis. So Swark said 0.2% interest was not sufficient to uh, subject the entity or the, the um, member to tax. So there have been a number of cases where they have tried to push the envelope on those and um, whether a 4.5% interest in an LLC um, would be subject to tax. And the court again looked at the, the control. Did the person who owned that 4.5% 4 interest in the, in the um, LLC, did they have any kind of control over the LLC? Did they have voting rights? Could they manage the LLC? Or were they just basically kind of like a limited partner with no rights whatsoever except to um, either uh, receive distributions um, in, in, uh, as a result of their ownership or not? Um, and the court said that the, the SWART 0.2% um, test is not a bright line test. You really have to look at what else is going on in that entity, whether there is any kind of control. Um, compare that to whether you've got a control interest if you are a, um, a corporate general partner of a California limited partnership. And the court there said, um, I'm sorry, but anytime you are a general partner, there is an implied level of control. And so if you've got, um, even if you are a completely out of state general partner, um, if you are, if you're, if you're, um, partnership is doing business in California, you are deemed to be doing business in California. So um, you've really got to be careful if you've got entities that have members from um, other states that you are really restricting their ability to control the, uh, the entity if you are trying to avoid being deemed to be doing business in California. Um, in addition to that, keep note that in November we will have on our ballot um, in California to vote on um, a, a potential change to the property tax um, uh, or the way that California will uh, tax um, corporate, um, basically corporate owned property. Uh, so keep um, your eyes open for that. And uh, the other thing that I thought was interesting is that we have conformity with the um, taxpayer and job uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, so we have a conformity there, except for with respect to qualified opportunity zones, and it doesn't change the uh, more broad um, conformity date of January 1, 2015. Um, we do not have a conformity yet as to the CARES Act. So um, all of that good stuff about loan forgiveness related to the payback program, net operating loss carrybacks, all the rest of it, we do not have conformity yet in California. So when you're advising clients, just let them know that California is not going to abide by those exact same rules. I um, think so in the comments section, I just, I gave my email address. Um, if you do have questions, you know, please reach out. Um, I see um, a couple, but I, I know I want to be respectful of everybody's time um, and we will you know, definitely get back to you with the questions. I'm sorry, I can't, I'm not sure I can see everyone's email addresses who asked the questions, so I just email you directly. Um, but please get in touch, and we're just so appreciative of having been invited today. Absolutely. Thanks for having us.